Good morning. Happy Sunday morning. Uh, here we are again on my daughter's back deck. It's a somewhat nice day. Uh, definitely a lot nicer than you're having back home. Uh, I do keep my you all in my prayers, those who have been affected by the, the flash flooding and everything. And uh, I've been in touch with uh, my husband and uh, so far everything there is okay. But I do see that there's a lot of people that aren't. So I do ask that everyone keeps the situation in prayer. Our scripture passage today is taken from Galatians chapter 1, reading verses 1 through 5. It says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This may shock you, but I can't dance. Well, I can dance, but not that well. I'm stiff. A lot of times I have very little rhythm. And most of the time I look like I'm having some sort of fit. My girls, however, they have a love for dance. Maybe they didn't have much choice in the matter as they danced from the time that they were two years old. I think sometimes I was hopeful that introducing them early would allow them to not be so self-conscious as I was in my teenage and adult years. I've often been jealous of people who could really dance their ease and their confidence, as I was only comfortable if I knew every step and could execute it perfectly. That leads me to a quote that is in my older years that I now understand. Those who dance are thought crazy by those who cannot hear the music. In the pages of this letter by Paul, he teaches us the steps of a dance, the dance of grace, only those who know Jesus can dance this dance, and it will make us look weird to the world when we can hear the music. This dance will free us from the idea that following rules can make us righteous before God. It can also help us to understand that our freedom is to be used to help others learn the same steps. I want to encourage you to read the entire book of Galatians. It's only 149 verses, and it takes about 20 minutes to read. The book contains six chapters, so if you read a chapter a day, you'll finish it in less than a week. The book of Galatians was written in AD 49, making it the earliest in the New Testament book. This is less than 20 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Other than the book of Romans, Galatians is the most concise description of the gospel in all of the Bible. It's been called the Magna Carta of Christianity, the Declaration of Christian Liberty, and the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation. It was in his studies of Galatians that Martin Luther was saved, and it was through Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians that Charles Wesley was saved. In fact, Martin Luther went as far as to say that the book of Galatians was like a wife to him. In the book of Galatians, we learn to dance to the rhythm of grace and freedom. Now, Tim Keller writes, the book of Galatians is dynamite. It is an explosion of joy and freedom, which leads us to enjoy a deep significant security and satisfaction in the blessing that God calls to his people. Galatians is a very different letter than most of Paul's writings. Its tone is sharp, angry at times, his words are strong and his message is crystal clear. In the churches that Paul and Barnabas had planted in the region of Galatia, false teachers had infiltrated into the ranks. Now these false teachers questioned Paul's authority. Their teachings went something like this. Listen, we agree that faith in Christ is important, but there's more to it. Paul, whoever he is, watered it down for you so you would accept his message. Jesus, yes, but you also need to be circumcised and follow the Mosaic dietary laws. In other words, you Gentiles need to become Jewish first. They didn't know what or who to believe. 
So Paul wrote them a letter to help them understand that Jesus plus nothing is everything. It is purely by grace that we come into a relationship with God. This book answers the legalists in their day and in ours. Christ sets us free from following the rules to get brownie, to get brownie points with God. Do you realize that many of us grew up this way, that we weren't supposed to go to movies, play cards, or dance? Although there is nothing, none of those prohibitions against these things are found in the Bible. Now, maybe you remember the movie Footloose. It was actually one of my favorite. In the movie, a new student named Wren moves to town and wants to have a school dance. The community, especially the church, is in an uproar. And at a meeting, Wren stood up and simply opened up the Bible and read verses about dancing. For the first 10 years of my Christian journey, I could probably say I was a judgmental legalist. I was no more about what I didn't do than what I actually believed in. But I'm so thankful that God set me free from that bondage and taught me the grace dance. When I attended church as a child, it was a common practice to sit at the dinner table after service and listen to, did you see what she had on today? Did you see the hat on that one? And those kids were so unruly. How dare they talk through the service? And then as an adult in school for ministry, the things that I heard were these. If God wanted women to preach, he would have been more specific about that in the Bible. Or when your ministry was thriving, it was God must be shining favorably down upon you. If that is how we talk to each other, then what do we look like to the world? Listen, you don't have to do anything. There is nothing you can do or not do that would make God love you any more or any less. This book also answers the autonomous who say, well, grace has freed us so we can do whatever we want. He'll forgive us, that's his job. We have not been set free to do whatever we want because we have been set free. We will desire to honor Jesus in every aspect of our lives. With all that said, let's look at Galatians chapter one. Paul, an apostle, sent not but from men, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me, to the church in Galatia. The author of this letter is Paul. That is the name that God gave him, because before that he was known as Saul. He was born into a Jewish family from the tribe of Benjamin. He grew up in Tyrus and was educated under the famous Rabbi Gamil. And he was also a Roman citizen. He was a strict Pharisee who persecuted the church. In fact, we first meet him in the Bible as he's holding the coats of men who were stoning Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church. He hated Christians and even went from town to town, rounding up men, women, and children. It was on one of those missions that he had an experience that changed his life and direction forever. On the road to the city of Damascus, he had an encounter with the risen Christ. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. He was blinded by the light and wandered into Damascus with the help of his companions. A Christian named Ananias was directed by God to go and to pray for Saul. And when he did, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Immediately, the persecutor became the preacher. He would be the one to take the gospel to the Gentiles on multiple successful missionary journeys, would do miracles, would be beaten, stoned, and nearly killed multiple times, would go on to write two thirds of the New Testament and would have his head cut off as a martyr in Rome in AD 63. 
A lot of times when Paul begins a letter, he describes himself as a slave to Christ. But in Galatians, he writes that he is the apostle, which simply means one sent with a message. There's a reason he starts this way. The Judaizers, what we call the false teachers, were questioning his credentials. Who is this Paul? He wasn't one of the 12 disciples that Jesus commissioned. They had seen the risen Christ, that had seen the risen Christ and had been taught by him. But so had Paul. He told the Corinthians, I am not free. I am not an apostle. Have I not, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He later writes that Christ appeared to him as one abnormal born and describes himself as the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He was not sent from men. There was no committee to gather together and decide that Paul would be an apostle. In 2010, I wrote a 50 plus page ordination paper and then had to go to an ordination council. A group of men and women went through this paper and grilled me for what seemed like hours. At the end I passed and then in a ceremony in the church, I did my ordination hours. They laid hands on me and commissioned me and I was officially ordained. Not so with Paul. He was not sent from man or by man. This is probably referring to Peter or James, two apostles that would have been recognized as leaders in the early church. Who had sent him? Paul was sent by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul was commissioned by Jesus himself. Already we sense that Paul's tone is terse. Why? Because the very gospel and the souls of his spiritual children are at stake. Here's an important thing to remember. The apostles, including Paul, were unique. They had walked with Jesus while he was here on earth. They had been taught and commissioned by him. Several of them were inspired to write books and scripture, but this was a limited group. There was no apostolic succession. Paul was writing from Antioch in Syria, and he includes in that salutation a group of people that are with him, and all the brothers and sisters with me. Interestingly, he doesn't name them as he usually does, but he wants the Galatian believer to know that there are others who can attest to his apostleship and his authority. To whom was the letter written? Well, it was written to the church in Galatia. Who was Paul writing to? Notice churches is plural. Galatia wasn't a city, but a geo geopolitical Roman region in Southern Turkey which includes the cities Debris, Iconium, Listeria, and Antioch and Pisidia. People wanted to live there because it was a fertile plain that was good for farming. Paul and Barnabas set sail from Antioch in Syria on the first missionary journey. They sailed to Cyprus where Paul confronted Elymas the sorcerer. Then they sailed to Perga where John Mark abandoned them and went back to Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas shared the gospel in Pisidian Antioch and the Gentiles responded and the church was born. The Jewish leaders finally got fed up with them and expelled them and they moved on to Ikeam. At Ikeam they preached the gospel and many Jews and Greeks believed and another church was born. They had to leave there because the Jewish leaders had planned to stone them. Do you kind of see a pattern here? They moved on to Listeria where Paul healed a man with a lame hand. The people went nuts and thought they were gods and started worshiping them. Paul quieted the crowd and shared the gospel and a church was born. And the Jewish leaders stoned him to the point where they thought that he was dead. They then moved on to Debir and preached the gospel and a church was born. They then went back through the territories to the new churches, encouraging them and appointing elders. They sailed back to Antioch in Syria and gathered the church to tell them all that God had done, opening a door for the Gentiles for faith in Jesus. 
It is while he was in Antioch that he gets a message that these new believers were being duped by these deceiving teachers. Paul was absolutely astonished that they wouldn't, that they would so quickly desert Jesus. What is the message that he has for them? Nothing less than the gospel. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to all the will of God the Father to whom glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul often begins his letters with grace and peace, but here they carry extra weight. Grace is the normal way a Gentile would begin a letter, and peace is the way a Jew would begin a letter. Grace is God's unmerited favor, which leads to peace with God, the peace of God, and peace with others. These Judaizers were putting a dividing wall between the Jews and the Greeks, one that Jesus tore down on the cross. For Ephesians chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law which its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put by which he put to death their hostility. Jews and Gentiles are saved by exactly the same thing, Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross. Think about it from their perspective. They could no longer go to the pagan temples, but they weren't welcome in the Jewish synagogues. Then these false teachers come to tell them that they aren't good enough for Jesus. They have to become Jews and be circumcised, follow the Mosaic dietary laws to be really saved. Paul isn't going to stand for this. And throughout the letter, he has some of the harshest language in all the Bible for these teachers that are perverting the gospel. So what is the central point of God's message? Well, that's Jesus Christ. He gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Martin Luther wrote that these words are the thunderclap from heaven Again, all self-righteousness. First notice that Jesus was a willing sacrifice. Mark records Jesus' words in chapter 10 and verse 35. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in John, Jesus says in chapter 10, verse 18, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. In Paul's letter in Titus chapter two, verse 14, he writes that we are waiting for Jesus to come back as it reads, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purity for himself, a people that are his own, eager to do what is good. Second, he notices the purpose of the sacrifice to rescue us from the present people evil age. The word rescue is a strong Greek word. It's the same idea used in describing the Israelites being rescued from Egypt or Peter being rescued from prison or Paul being rescued from an angry mob. Because of our sin, we are separated from God and we can't be good enough to earn the relationship back. But Jesus died on the cross for our sins in our place to pay our debt. Imagine going to a doctor with a sprained ankle and the doctor says, I'll take that for you. And immediately your foot feels fine, but you notice the doctor's limping. Jesus, the only person in all of history that didn't deserve to go to hell. It was the only person that fulfilled the law perfectly because he never sinned. But on the cross, he took our sins in order to give us his righteousness and to rescue us from the evil age. Galatians chapter 1 verse 13 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom he has redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So why did he do this? Sheer grace. He didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. But God accepted the work of Christ on the cross on our behalf. 
this was the will of the Father, who loves you so much that he'd rather die than live without you. As it says in John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He doesn't want to take us out of the present evil age, but he wants to teach us how to dance to the rhythm of freedom and grace in the midst of a lost and dying world. Paul is so overwhelmed by the grace given to us that he breaks into doxology. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The gospel does change everything. I wish you a good Sunday and a blessed week. Until we meet again, have a great day.